Welcome Tiffany Cromwell and thank you so much for speaking at our Be Here Now ladies lunch yesterday at the Columbus Hotel in Monaco. It was a huge success so thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was a great honour to be there and yeah, met some pretty amazing women as well and exciting to share my story. Yes, many people are still ranting and raving about it. You touched so many people's hearts yesterday and the main message people were saying how humble you are and it was amazing to hear about your trials and tribulations and all the struggling you know being so young and traveling alone and living in different countries so could you please tell the audience a little bit about your background so they know what led you to be the amazing professional cyclist you are today? Yeah, so obviously I'm Australian. I grew up in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, from, you know, very middle class family, two brothers, mum, my dad, um, always very sporty. You know, I think being Australian, it's in our culture. At school, you always do a lot of sport. I think I was just some a kid with way too much energy as well. So I was always running around outside. I was fortunate enough that we lived in a property that we had space to run around. We were very close to a national park as well. Um, I had a brother who was two years older than me, so I was always trying to keep up with him. And Basketball was my main sport for many, many years, and I think it just ran the family, even though we were all quite short, so I don't know how we ended up there, but you know, dad was a coach, mum played when she was younger, um, my brothers both played, and so it was just a natural fit, just did that. Did a little short stint of a few years doing ballet, but you know, progressed through, but then it was through this program called the Talent ID, that the State Sports Institute do. It was saying that at the time they were doing it around Australia with each local institute, and then obviously headed by the Australian Institute of Sport as part of this pathway to try and get either sports that were struggling for participation, or to be able to get these kind of diamonds in the rough, these kids an opportunity where they could get them to an Olympic Games is the ultimate goal. Um, so I came through that as just a simple fitness test that we did at school in sports class, like a shuttle run, you know, vertical jump, we did a height, a basketball throw, just these very basic things that they can look at certain parameters and say, okay, because you're 200 centimeters tall, you could be a good volleyball player, or because you can go over level eight or something in the beep test, you've got great endurance, you can be a good cyclist. So when we did that, then our results got sent to the State Institute. They test us again, just to make sure, you know, of a select group to say, okay, from the results of school sent, looks good, but we just want to double check, make sure there's no errors. Did that, then I got a letter saying, you've been invited to try cycling at the velodrome. Come at this time, you know, and there you yeah. go. I think there were two sessions I could come to. So I went down there, I had no idea what this sport was, you know. At the time, <laughs> wasn't popular in Australia, you know, still a growing sport. People that rode around on a bike and like, you're like, oh, what the, you know. Wasn't saying that ever came under my radar um, or into my radar. So then went to the velodrome, which was pretty daunting when you first walk in there because you've got these, this 250 metre track with steep bankings. You get given a bike with no brakes, um, so it's all fixed wheel and kind of like get told right around the track. But don't go too slow in the corners because you go too slow, you slide down. Wow. So, yeah, exactly. Were, and how old were you then? I was 12 then. Wow, yeah. that's so intimidating. Just listening to you, I can imagine yeah. no brakes and... Yeah, exactly. Like, you fast. know, as kids you run around like on yeah. BMXs or whatever, but one of these never... So anyway, did those sessions, went to the lab, they do a VO2 max test just to see... Um, obviously, again, it's a yeah. measure of endurance and your lung capacity and again, they can take things from that. And from that, they said, okay, we think you have potential. And there was a group of maybe 10 or 12 of us of, from schools all around South Australia that were invited. And, you know, so then we had our group. We'd go a couple of times a week to the velodrome, do some training sessions together. We'd do basic skills as well, which was great because we learned a lot of the fundamentals of the sport. And they kept us in that because it was a controlled environment. And step by step, they then took us out onto the road. But there you got more variables because of cars and everything else and clipping pedals and all this. So, you know, they wanted to make sure they progressed us first. And, yeah. It wow. took a while before I loved the sport, for sure, because, you know, it wasn't something I fell in love with. I was never the strongest, especially when I was younger. Um, but I just stuck at it, and right. bit by bit, you know, enjoyed it more and more, and basketball less and less, and here we are today. Wow. So that must have been a shock for your family, from basketball to cycling as well. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, they've always been so supportive, and, like, as a family, we'd always ride bikes, so, you know, but, like, to do competitive cycling... 
for sure it was a lot of learning curve, you know, it's not the cheapest of sports either, like basketball, it's okay, I think you had your yearly club fees and a uniform and a basketball, you know, and maybe yeah. some shoes, um, so let's say $100 or something, to now you're looking at bikes, which at that time probably the cheapest bikes, you're looking at about $1,000, you wow. know, and although we had help through the town ID, they did supply some bikes and then gave us discounted bikes as well to help us and, you know, maybe one set of kit. But even that, like, cycling kit is incredibly expensive as well, you know. Just a jersey and shorts and the most basic of brands will set you back at least $200, $250. Then you got cycling shoes, then you have the helmet. You know, there's a few thousand dollars just there in something that will you stick at it, will you no, don't stick at it. So I was fortunate that my parents were super supportive and, you know, also found some local sponsors as I got a little bit more into it through the junior ranks that helped along the way in terms of, you know, just giving us discounts at the bike shop to buy equipment or some that would help with travel expenses as well because to compete, obviously, to keep progressing, you had to compete around Australia um, to be against the best riders because yeah. I was a junior rider then, so the other junior riders, you know, if you want to be the best in Australia, to then be able to progress, to be able to go to, like, an international level. So, you know, they were, yeah, yeah my well, biggest supporters for sure and wouldn't be where I am now without them backing it and never, you know, putting pressure on me or saying no and saying, no, you can't do this type of thing. Yeah. That's incredible. You know, I remember you saying yesterday how the females never got paid years ago yeah. and it's still small money now and peanuts compared to what the men play, get paid. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a topic that's, it's definitely a big conversation at the moment now with equality. Not only in sport, but I think in everything from work to to anything, you know. Um, and it's a shame that we always have to fight for that. The sport, yes, there's huge discrepancies, but there are changes happening, which is exciting. There are more, particularly in, I guess, more forward-thinking countries like the UK, like Australia, like the US, that want to show equality and want to push the raise the bar. But, yeah, we're definitely still having to fight hard and, yeah, in the early days, you know, that's why you saw a big drop off in the sport. You know, women that had potential to go a lot longer in the career but chose to stop early because either they want to have a family, they wanted to be able to have savings in their bank account, they wanted to not be living on a shoestring budget, like just, you know, eating a bag of lettuce for the whole week type thing. Yeah. So we're fortunate that, yeah, like I said, at the moment now the sport is progressing very quickly. Still a long way to go, but, you know, I think for the girls and the women – three to five years down the track is going to get to that level and hopefully one day get closer to close that gap. Will we ever close the gap to the men of true equality? I don't know. But yeah, there's definitely some good things. But in my early years, for sure, the support that I've had to get me to where I am has been hugely helpful and a lot of my sport I haven't done for the money. I've done it because I love it, for the passion, for the experiences I've had to travel the world, you know, so many things that you can't put a dollar value on. Wow. Well, I guess we are very lucky to be able to watch your talent. And I think it's wonderful that Australia are looking and, you know, you were very fortunate to have the financial backing. And I'm sure people listening to this, young girls in your position, um, they've got some hope, you know, because I'm sure there's many people who are out there that haven't got money and the parents are less fortunate financially. So it's good to be inspired to know that there is hope and there's people spotting people with talent. Yeah, you know. I, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, there's more people always wanting to give back, you know. Even saying, I'd like to do when I finish my career, give back to, you know, the younger riders coming through because you know how much that can help, even if it's just as much as giving your old kit to them, you know, because there's a huge amount of money that can save the parents, you know, give them some of your old kit, which they'd love, which is all, you know, fantastic stuff, stuff that... You know, I have bags of cycling clothing that hasn't even been worn, for example. Because obviously wow. we're fortunate enough from our sponsors, we get given a lot of kit throughout the year. So, you know, little things like that. Or, you know, we have a lot of other top professionals who've set up, you know, little teams as well to help give those stair steps. Or, you know, as Australians, the biggest jump is trying to get to Europe or to America. Because to race at the top, you need to be in Europe. That's where the biggest races are. And giving those pathways, like we are fortunate that we do have the likes of the talent search and... Over the years, it has changed a little bit, but Australian government are still, you know, big supporters of progressing and, you know, giving pathways for sport because 
we want to be one of the best nations. We want to be the best nation, obviously, top the charts at the Olympics, inspire more, you know, generations to keep doing sport, to keep representing our country, because, you know, there's no greater um, honour than to represent your country on the global stage. So that's definitely their goal. So then they want to support these pathways and even still support the top athletes because they know supporting them helps our career, then then ultimately inspires the younger generations and it's this whole circle effect. And I see even, even like, you know, going to other sports now, we talked about quality and stuff like that. Going back to Australia or even the UK, I've seen as well, like now having women's soccer or football, you know, Aussie rules, Australian rules football, now there's a big women's league, you know, all these things that before women were like, we love that, but we can't play that because there's no women's league. But now, you know, they have their own league, they're playing in the biggest ovals, you know, it's from year one to year, I think they're about to start year four. It's just had huge progression, you know, so much support for that. And it gives, you know, these young girls saying, why can't I do that? Now they're going to say, yeah, I can do that. And if I want to do that, it's not just because it's a boys sport, it can be anybody's sport, which I think that's, you know, really exciting for the next generations. Yeah, and I think it's great as well because in Australia you have the weather and yeah. people love being outdoors, so there's a lot more sports that people can do. Yeah, and it's fun for the whole family and like you say, you it's such a great honour to represent your country. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. like the very first time I got my Australian jersey, I was fortunate enough I got to represent Australia at quite a young age as a junior. You know, coming overseas and getting your first ever Aussie kit, you know, you dream of that day, like, to have the green and gold. And I remember I came home and wearing it all the time in training, being so proud. And, yeah, then I progressed and, you know, I've been able to represent them on the world stage at the World Championships, at the Commonwealth Game level, you know. It, it is very special. And sometimes you forget that, but then when you are amongst your Aussies, like, okay, most of the year I'm representing a trade team. So it's not Australia. Like, I'm always representing Australia as an Australian, but not yeah. in Australian colours. So, you know, the whole year representing my team, Canyon Shram. But then you come back to a group of Australians. They all speak a language. They all understand our banter, our slang language and everything else. And you're in that green and gold and you're like, yeah, this is amazing. And then when you have, obviously, you know, the Aussies back home, like seeing that. And yeah, it makes you realise like how special it really is. Wonderful. And I know you mentioned yesterday you're looking forward to heading back home to Australia soon. Yeah. And um, what are your plans from there? Yeah, so normally I always go home for Christmas and then January, because I'm fortunate that in that period it's kind of our pre-season moving into the main season. But I, you know, do you have the choice to stay in Europe in the cold and try and train or do you go to summer? So I, of course, I always chase the sun being an Australian and <clears throat> it's a good chance to be able to see my family and it's a nice time to be in Australia. Uh, we have some early season races there now, which is really cool. There's some world, world-class world races, so I'll be back for that. But next year's a big year. It's an Olympic year with Tokyo 2020. It's definitely a big, big goal of mine. I've been through, this will be the fourth Olympic cycle, although 2008, I wouldn't say I was ever really a factor in there, but, you know, I saw that cycle. And then since 2012, I've been very close to making the team but I haven't quite got there so it's still something I want to achieve before I finish my career and got you know learn a lot from the last two processes because you know it's not as straightforward as maybe what you see like be the fastest be the best do this do that that doesn't necessarily get you on the start line in cycling because you know there's so many other factors like the course needs to suit you there's only four spots if you're in the top five nations which Australia's lucky because we're a strong nation and we have four spots but then I have to compete against maybe 10 other 12 other very strong women for those four spots. So then you need to have a spot that fits whatever the goal. The goal is to win gold, ultimately. So then they find someone who they know is capable of that and build a team around them. So you have to look at all these things and where you can fit into that, whether you're the one to go for the result or to help, and all of these different factors. Wow. So at least, you know, the natural program is a lot more open than perhaps what it used to be in terms of knowing where you stand, knowing what they want to see from you, which so then that gives me more confidence to say, okay, I know what I have to do, now I just need to go and do it. Wow. And so it's up to me at the end of the day, like, if I want to be there, it's up to me to show that I'm capable to be there and to do the role that they would want to take me there for. So, yeah. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. And much. what would you say has been your biggest challenges to date? Obviously, we've heard about your financial challenges, yeah. but I know you're living in Monaco away from all your teammates and yeah. family and friends. Yeah, well. there's definitely been different challenges along the way. 
I'd say the hardest is, you know, those low periods, the times when maybe you just can't seem to get everything matching together and you're not performing. So then when you're not performing, you're usually sad or depressed from those things because, you know, we put so much into the sport, so much passion, so much energy, mm -hmm. like when things aren't going right, you take it out on the closest people around you or push the closest people around your way. Um, you know, I had the moments, 2011 was a year which was really, really tough. It was just a year where, again, I just moved. I moved to Monaco at that time and it was quite different to what I was used to, you know, in terms of just having a close community around me. I only had a couple of close friends and spent a lot of days training by myself, whereas where I lived in the past, there was always a group to ride with and all these various factors and that combined with I wasn't having a great year racing. So it was just everything built up and then I just, you know, just lost a lot of it. So every day it was like hard to get out of bed, hard to get on the bike, hard to just go through the motions and then get to the bike race. You're the first one dropped and, you know, all those things. It's just like, why am I doing this? Maybe question why I was still doing the sport. But I had good people around me that, you know, I took a few weeks off, some time away. I changed teams as well. And then it made me realize, actually, I still love the sport and I still have a lot that I want to get out of it. So then was given, had people that still believed in me, which was really good, it gave me some opportunities and then I got things back on track. Um, and then another time was definitely, you know, missing out on the Olympics in 2016. Because 2012 I say is a different experience because that was unexpected to be in the mix coming off of a year like 2011. And it was like suddenly I was in the mix and I was like, oh, maybe if I go amazing, but right. at the same time, you know, it wasn't something that I was like, yes, 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 I'm for sure. Like, whereas four years on, I was like, okay, I have a great chance, got taken over there the year before to look at the course, you know, it was one of the main riders in the, from 2014 to around 2016, I was one of the main riders for Australia when we went to the World Championships, often given that role as a lead rider, so I was really cementing my place as one of the top Australian riders on the world circuit. And I think just, we started then 2016, obviously, an Olympic year, everyone knows how to step up because they know how cutthroat is to make those spots and everybody wants those spots. And I just went from, yeah, one race went bad, was on my shoulders, next race, next race, just this downward spiral where I couldn't just put the one bad race behind me and reset. So then, you know, that build up, build up, build up with in the back of your mind, the pressure saying how much you want mm. that, be seeing, you know, these other Australians going stronger than you in different teams and all this. And I just crumbled completely. And again, I completely shut everyone out. I was just super, because I could see my dream going away, you know, right. the one dream that, I was, there's still other things I want to achieve, but this this one thing that, you know, I've always wanted to achieve and it, I could just see it getting further and further away and I was like, you know, losing, again, losing love yeah. and just, you know, putting in all this hard work and things just not coming together. And during that period, do your team offer psychological support with a psychologist, for example? The team are always there. I've been fortunate enough with my team. They've always been there and always been there to help and we'll find solutions if we need help. But things like a psychologist, it's very independent. I think the reason why the team has never got a team psychologist is because, okay, we're a German team. We have seven or eight nationalities. You know, say if you get a German psychologist, that's not going to work for everyone because something is personal psychology, I think. You need to be able to speak your own language. Yes. Everyone needs to be on their own first language. So, you know, if I'm, say, talking to a German psychologist but maybe doesn't understand everything because of translations, so... For sure, if they said, if I said, yes, I want help, I need some, they would help me 100%. Right. But I've always been fortunate. That year, I was working with a psychologist um, okay. through the national program as well because I've always been right. fortunate through them. We still have some support with the road program to, right. you know, tools like that, like, you know, nutritional psychologists, all these. So it's kind of like that balancing act of like, and every team's different. Our team's awesome with many things. And if we ask for help, they will try to find solutions within reason. Yeah. But then I've always known, I've always had the Australian outlet as well. So right. they definitely did, you know, they could see, obviously, I was on a downward spiral and they pulled me out and said, look, what's wrong? What can we do to help? What do you feel like you need to change? You know, because of course, if they're paying us, one, they want us to perform. Secondly, they also want to help us to be better, to be the best athlete we can be. So if we're not performing, they want to find solutions of how we can change that. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Because I've worked with a lot of depressed people with my background yeah. and when you're feeling low, it's so hard to get back up and I know you said that you're living here now in Monaco and the rest of the team are in other places yeah. and just to get that motivation to get out of bed in the morning and do your training. Oh, completely. 
you know we, it's not like a normal sport where you have a stadium to go to every day or a place a pool every day you know where your whole team is there and although you know there's certain elements that I do enjoy being away from the team you know to yeah. be able to do my thing because yeah this sport does require a lot of dedication discipline but we spend so much time on the road together like on top of each other you know whenever we're at a race we're sharing hotel rooms with another teammate mm. it's like full 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 so you do want that little bit of space sometimes but the flip side as you say like if you don't have that motivation, sometimes you need someone to help. But we're fortunate yeah. around the Monaco area. We have a fantastic community. A lot of other cyclists here, like a lot of other professionals, and even just ones that do it for fun. So it's as simple as just saying, hey, I want to go for a ride, just to get you out the door so you have someone yeah. to meet. And it can make all the difference because then you're out. Whereas if you don't have that, be like, okay, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, yeah, I need to train, so I need to train, you know, and then you're training way yeah. later than what you should be. You're not motivated. You don't have that same energy and... Yeah, so it's as simple, and, and everybody knows that. And people are happy to at least start together, even if it's just for an hour, and then you go off. And then off the bike too, the same thing. Like when I talked about that time when I had that very, very low point, and I was closing a lot of clo- close people out, just being like, you know, being like, yeah, hey, all good, but actually being in my apartment just by myself, you know, not wanting to be around anyone. And it was one of my closest friends. Um, she basically came around. She's like, I'm coming around. I was like, okay. So she came, knocked on my door. Mm-hmm kind of walking around my apartment all weirdly like you know she was she was on a mission to break me basically to get me to talk to get me to open up to cry like I'm not an emotional person I never cry or very rarely so Mm -hmm. yeah and she did and it was what I needed because she made me realize it wasn't the end of the world there were things bigger than the Olympics there's so many things I can be proud of so many things still to achieve that I shouldn't let that get everything down and it's just what I needed but You know, I'm one of these people, as a lot of athletes are, stubborn, you know, keep everything inside, show we're tough, because, you know, if you show weakness, they don't, you know, you think, oh, you show weakness, like, you can be broken, but you need to show strength and that you're unbreakable and all this stuff. But actually, we're all humans, we're all hard on ourselves, and we have to remember, be happy, be positive, let people ask for help when you need help, and everything works then. Yeah, everything flows when you're happy. Exactly. And you... I understand that you have a lot of pressure to perform well for one, your team, and also your country. Yeah. And you just mentioned achievements. What has been your biggest achievement to date? I've probably got a handful of note from personal as results. For sure, I've had a couple of very big achievements that I'm very proud of. It's I had a stage, uh, I won the Omelette Pet Newsblad, which is one of the first Belgian classics. Shamir is kind of like, yeah. It, it was pretty special. I hadn't won a one-day race like that before. And wow. that was, you know, it was just at a time. It came at the perfect timing and really happy. And also won a couple of stages of the Women's Giro d'Italia, which is one of the biggest stage races. Um, but definitely representing my country. You know, I was part of the team that won gold in Gold Coast. And I was a row captain as well. So obviously being able to captain Team Australia and us bring home gold. And although it's only one person gets a medal, it was very, very much a team effort. And that was because it was a home games as well, like, being there with the team in the team Australian colours, like that was yeah, pretty big, pretty amazing. Oh, I'm sure you yeah. would have been totally euphoric. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like to anyone who doesn't know the Commonwealth Games, like what is that? But when you're a Commonwealth nation to the people, you realise just how big it is. And like for cycling, because of its nature, we don't look as it's massive, whereas some other sports like swimming and athletics and you know, these ones where their key events really are world championships when big games, Commonwealth Games. Mm-hmm you know, they're the biggest key events. For us, it's like amazing and incredible to be able to take part in. And it's, it's when you're there, you're like, yeah, actually it is a big deal. So yeah, that was probably, probably one that's definitely up there as well. Fantastic. And what was it like being the team captain? It's pretty special, you know, because obviously it's, it's a lot of pressure um, because you're the one that if there's difficult calls on the road to make, like, so the role of the team captain is basically... We sit down beforehand, we come up with our plan, but obviously you have to go against every other team's plans. Good way to explain is chess on wheels, combine (laughs) some poker. So it is, it's like, okay, you have that, but you can plan exactly how you want your race to go, but nine times out of ten, it's not going to go that way. So if suddenly different dynamics happen, we're like, okay, what do we need to do to fix this situation if we've missed something or if it's not how we planned it? So then that's where the pressure falls on me to be able to make those strong calls. And so... Although it's quite nervous at times, at the same time, you know, to be trusted with that responsibility, 
and to have so many teammates that obviously believe in me and what I have to say and trust me to make those decisions, it's, it's quite an honour, you know. And I definitely, yeah. to start with, struggled a bit more with that position. On the bike, no worries. I can always do the tactics. But yeah. off the bike, because, you know, it's to be a captain both on and off the bike are two different things. And, you know, off the bike, as always, friends that run by, I always keep kind to myself, not necessarily being that leader that you sometimes need to be, yeah. you know, putting together, leading by example, these things. Whereas now I'm getting a lot better with that, you know. Because also with my trade team, with Canyon Shram, I'm often in that position. And particularly this year, I've really embraced a lot more having quite a few younger riders I guess and them seeing them look up to me and really ask them for the advice and everything it's like okay I see they really appreciate it and it's me giving me more confidence in myself to be able to say yeah I want to help them give them my experiences and then in a race situation as well you know give them their yeah. roles because I know the important because I've been there I've been them you know yeah so, so yeah it is it's a huge honor like and yeah like I say because not everybody can do that role exactly and um what would a typical week look f like for you as a professional cyclist? I don't think there's ever a typical uh -huh. week. Um, and in season to out season. Typically, you know, yeah, it's very dependent on what the race schedule is. So sometimes you might be in a full race schedule period. So it'll be like, okay, if we're racing on the weekend, then it will be training on and off, day on, day off, into lead up to a key event. So, you know, normally I'll wake up in the mornings, have some breakfast, whatever, go training for anywhere from one hour on a recovery day or up to five hours for a long day, sometimes slightly longer, but hopefully normally not. A um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> couple times a week I'll be in the gym as well, doing just like some strength or core training. Um, then it's a lot of chill time. Once a week I'll try to get massage as well just because obviously that's very, very important for yeah. the recovery process. Um, some time with my friends as well if I'm at home, versus if we're on a training camp, then it's different. It's, you know, you got wake up, train, relax, maybe you got meetings, maybe you got physio. I, at a race, it's always, typically we'll get there two days before, and that the first day is normally a travel day and relax. The day before a race is like a pre-race day, so you'll wake up, your breakfast, you ride together as a team, normally hour, hour and a half, a few openers, and then the rest of the day is relax, we'll have massages, then we'll have like the team meeting for the tactics to talk about the plans for the following day, and then the next day is always race day. But then, you know, you could be, a week could be racing for a week as well, so that's why it's yeah. like always changing, or I could be on a full training week, where then it's different, maybe I'll be three days training hard, one day easy, two days training hard, one day easy. So a lot of it's, you know, quite normal in certain respects in terms of wake up, train, whatever else is left, yeah. I do, depending how I feel. Um, but yeah, some, something um, along those lines. <laughs> and um, how much does psychology play a part? Like, do you do a lot of visualisation as a team or individually to visualise the way the race is going to go? Psychology is a massive part of the sport. Like, massive. I'd say it's 50% of performance. As a team, I wouldn't say we do it together because I'd say everyone's so individual with those sorts of things how they want to do it how they want to visualize for sure we'll talk about you know when we sit down in a meeting they're very good at giving us as much information as possible so they'll say okay here's the overall map the wind direction is going to be here 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 and here we have street view of this we got numbers about this climb of you know percentage grades blah 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 so from that you can then prepare your own visualizations like often if we can get video footage will show you like finish straights but then again, then it's up to each individual how they want to best do it. Because some, for me, for example, you show me a map of piece of paper, goes in one ear out the other or through one eye out the other. <laughs> Versus I write it, I remember every single corner, every single up, down, hole, everything. Because I've got this weird ability just to, be, I do something once and I'll like remember all these things just because when I see it, I can, you know, I think that's just how my brain yeah. works. So, but definitely like, Sometimes you want to visualize, you want to visualize how you're going to do it, where you're going to do your attack, where you're going to like relax, think where the wind's coming from, think where you have to be on the road, all these different things. But like I said, from the visualization side, yeah, it's everyone has their own ways of how they want to do it, if they want to do it. Um, and yeah, the very, but we get given all the tools possible if we need them to help prepare us for the race.
Yeah, well, I guess when you watch the sports on TV, people don't realise everything, the tactics that go on behind the scene, especially like you mentioned the wind. Yeah. So I guess if the wind is head on, it must be so difficult to train and also do the race or if it's raining or blowing a gale. Yeah, definitely, you know, those are like there was one day not long ago I went out when it was raining and I was like, this is a difference between professional and being an amateur. An amateur doesn't have to go out in these conditions. As a pro, we sometimes just have to, as we say, harden the whatever up and just go out <laughs> and do it. But um, definitely those days are the days you don't enjoy, but you know they're the days that make you stronger. Um, in a race situation, you have no choice. And again, everyone, I'd say rain and wind factors takes out probably 50% of the bunch because they get scared about it. They're like, oh, the rain, it's slippery, you crash, this, that, because for sure, much higher rate chance of crashes, you get cold, bring the white clothing as well. Like we're fortunate now that, you know, more and more brands are giving really good or producing really good clothing for these conditions. But yeah, that side is much, much more mental. But of course, any elements yeah. is hard or makes the sport even harder than what it already is. But it's about knowing how to deal with them and knowing how to best you. Like with the wind is easy. It's like, yes, it's hard, but if you know how to position, know how to use people around you, it's easy. Well, it's yeah. never easy, but where some people don't yeah. understand and and that comes with experience. But, you know, when you do watch it, like wind can be a massive decisive factor in a race that people don't realise. Like, you know, in Holland, it's a flat country. Like, oh, how can it be so hard? But it's very windy. Right. That's windy and narrow, so you know if you don't know how to ride crosswind, for example, you'll be dropped. Whereas wow. if you know how to, like even if you're not the strongest rider, you can master those races. So that's where there's so many things like, as you say, just if you're watching, you know nothing about the sport, you're like, what is this for? It's boring, whatever. But if you know all these different dynamics, know okay, wind's coming from the right, you want to put it in the left, use your team together to then split the field by keeping it tight, making it so everyone else is in the wind, so they're exposed, having to fight and push a lot harder. And same as with climbing. Again, even climbing, yeah. you know, for me, it's like I want a headwind on the climb because sitting behind someone in it, the climbers can never go that much faster because it's so hard. Whereas right. you're a bit more, you're a lot more protected behind. Whereas a tailwind climb is horrible because they can climb fast and you get no protection yourself. So then you have to try and go at the same speed. You know, right. it just doesn't. Yeah. It just favors them a lot more because if they're already strong, then they have nothing that is stopping them with the resistance. They can just go, you know, crazy. Whereas head are like, yes, okay, they can't go that hard because it's too hard on the front and then I'm getting nicely yeah. protected behind. So, so how manageable. does it actually work? Because you're talking about the person in the front. I know as a team, one person is set to lead the way. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, so it's, you're always going to have wind somewhere um, with people in front of you. It's like a slipstream, like you sit behind a truck you get towed along just because the nature of the slipstream, because it's so big and just generates right. this, this stream, you know, that helps you along, yeah. helps save you watts or power, whatever else that we say. So with that, it's like, okay, the aim of the game in cycling is to use the least amount of power possible until it really counts. Because each time you spend a little bit here, a little bit there, like say a plate of cookies, you put, do one attack there, there's one cookie taken. You only right. have 10 cookies. You're then fighting in the wind instead of having your teammates around you. There's another two cookies. Right. You want to then chase something, you know. So bit by bit, if you're using all your cookies too quickly, you don't right. have the energy when it really counts when it comes to that final sprint or that final big attack. So that's where you utilize your team. So then you get them to ride in front of you. So then you're getting the free ride, the slipstream, while they can use their bickies before you because they know what the role is. They can do that. And they can be gone at the time when you need to have the pressure to say, make that race winning move or have the legs to do that final sprint. So it's all, you know, lots of different dynamics like that. And yes. But then it's also a game against other teams because say you have a breakaway up the road of, people it doesn't matter, but you know you can bring it back. But yeah. you don't want to show another team that you're going to use all your riders first. You want to push them to ride them, make them panic before you're ready to. Because again, then if you lose your riders, if they use all their cookies, before you're left vulnerable of maybe like you may be one but then a team has three riders still yeah you're going to get attacked wow so there's all those sorts of things so it's like yeah there's so many different things right they can Tactical. affect exactly you know and even you know a team knowing that they know that they can have the numbers at the end so they're like well great we know that strong rider 
she's going by herself because she doesn't have the teammates who are strong enough to go when it counts, like at these, when it's a very selective course. So we know we have three, so we can just keep attacking her. And then she has to play the game like, well, if one goes, she's not going to do that because then the next one's going to go. Then they just cover that. And then again, it's these cookies. Boom, boom, boom. They're all using one at a time. She's using two, two, two. She's using six while all of them used one each. Wow. So, yeah. Exciting. And who would you say or who or what has inspired you most in life? Hmm. On your journey. Yeah. Definitely, there's always, there's so many people along the way who've definitely inspired me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always inspired by impressive performances. You know, I've had various teammates. One early on, I had Uta Tharn. She was wow. a German teammate. She was one of the best of her time. For sure, she helped me as a writer develop because she, she was, again, at the end of her career, so I was kind of in my early development years of, like, making that transition in the European peloton. Um, one of my best friends who's here, Lizzie Dignan, for sure, she's, even though she's my best friend, there's plenty of things she's done that I've watched and been like, you know, it's either helped me, like, within my career, just watching her and seeing her process and everything else. Like, she's gone on to, she's first a silver medalist in London Olympics, she's gone to be world champion, won a bunch of races, she's now had a child and made a comeback. So just seeing the way she's operated and her strength mentality and her confidence you know, because we train a lot together and I see that, I'm like, why can't I be as good, you know, at the same level as her sometimes? Yeah. It's like, and then it's all these other little things that she has going on. And for me, it's, yeah, it's inspiring to watch and obviously a huge influence, you know, I can, even if I can just take a couple of things from what she's doing, I'm like, yeah, that can make me a better bike rider. And yeah. Cool. And some of my coaches as well, for sure, that have helped me along the way, whether I say they inspired me, but, you know, like the, my manager, director, who I work with now, Ronnie Lauka, like, We've been working together now six years and for sure he's you know he's continued to believe in me to where I'm now but the flip side has also been really hard when he's needed to be and times when I haven't liked it and maybe been like yeah whatever maybe some argumentative times but in the long run it's been what I needed and he's not it's what I needed so right. yeah definitely a lot of people that have helped me along the journey and well that's brilliant and I've especially watched. to have a close friend living here as yeah. well Definitely. So, um, would you say that's um, a good way of staying on top, or what three things would you say uh, have helped you to stay on top? Um, always being hungry, I'd say. Hungry for yeah. more, hungry for success. Um, definitely having good people around me, you know, the not times when I have been a bit lost, being able to realize that, whether that's through someone giving me a harsh talking to, saying, like, get yourself together. You know what's going on um, that's kept me for sure on top and you know just being happy like finding my happiness having yeah. you know the very close community around me like there's a handful of people that are as we say it's like that in a team yeah that for every successful athlete they have that team around them and that's for sure keep to me like that balance of like you know knowing the times when they know I need a bit of fun to times when they know to let me respect when I have to say no I don't want to go out I need to stay at home or these various things like yeah just know that keeps me happy when they see me happy then they know I'm going to be better by crying. yeah because it's so hard to balance work rest and play oh, 100% yeah um, and, and I've had trouble with that many times over the years but now I feel like I'm finally getting on top of it and I've had yeah. periods where I've been on top of it then I've cracked yeah but now it's finally I'm like yeah I feel that balance that works for me because again it's also very very individualized right and um, you mentioned as captain the young people would look up to you what would you advice would you give to someone who wants to start a professional cycling career say don't be afraid to ask questions because too many are too scared particularly you know asking the top girls questions because they're never going to buy it they're not going to say no they will be willing to help because we've all been there um and having good people around you, good people who support you, to advise you as well, because there's too many vultures within the sport for sure. Like there are a handful of top teams, but there's plenty of bad teams out there that will take advantage of younger riders, like either, yeah. you know, saying yeah, yeah, we give you a contract, this, that, promise everything, and then you know maybe not mm. give them support that they need at the most important times. So that's the biggest sport, just not being afraid to ask questions and reach out. Because yeah. you know, we can all, we've all been there and we've all gone through all the different things that 
it takes, whether it's from a performance aspect, whether it's living in a foreign country, whether it's as much as helping out with visas, just having friends in a community, yeah. And um, you mentioned the German psychologists earlier, and you're living in Monaco, which is French-speaking. Yeah. How many languages do you speak, or have you found you need to speak languages? Or It's funny, actually, because languages are something I love, but I'm one of these people who, like, I've always been fine with studying. You know, I didn't do yeah. terribly at school or anything like this. Like, I was always quite okay. But I'm always one, I need to be in that environment. I need to be in a classroom environment to that. I'm not one of these. I can sit and read a book and then I'm, I can't sit still. So I've winged it a lot with languages. I've always loved trying to speak them, but I wouldn't mm. say I'm influent in anything other than English. But I definitely, over the years of living around Monaco and France, I've um, got a decent hold on French, I'd say. Confident enough to say, okay, I can get things done and I can call people to say, yeah, I need this, this, this. So I can be argumentative if I need to. Give them the harsh word <laughs> to an extent. Um, but full on conversation like this, I would yeah. say no. Then probably Italian's the next one and learn a little bit of Spanish as well. But normally when I speak that, it's a whole combination of French, Italian, and Spanish. Um, obviously, German, I've, I do understand bits and pieces. Speaking German, definitely only got a few words in there. But, you know, obviously hearing it a lot, I'm like, oh yeah. And then there's a lot of random languages where I just have, you know, a few words here and there. So. Yeah, it's fun though, cool. I love it and I'm always, would love to be in a position where I'm forced to speak the language but in this day and age, every good professional team now I think, English is the first language so you're not forced whereas at the start of my career there were a few teams that you went to them and you had to speak their language like particularly Italian teams, French teams, it just how it was, you know, if you didn't yeah. you weren't understanding anything but I was just after that period so partners like would have been a cool experience, a hard experience, but a good one to be able to be in that situation. Yeah. But the flip side, I've also been with some amazing teams. So, yeah. Fantastic. It's opened up a whole new world for you with this traveling as well. Oh, completely. And earlier you mentioned branding and you also mentioned fun. <laughs> and I know that you've done the Cox ride, the um, cycling, oysters. Champagne oysters. Like that's that. it. Yep. Yeah, so do you want to tell the audience a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So it's something, I yeah, got involved with it in one of the early years, about year three or something. It's basically a group of the boys who are friends with the prince. They randomly decided one year, they all, I think they all got new bikes, that's where it started. They're like, oh, we're going to ride to Saint-Tropez. So they decided to do that from Monaco to Saint-Tropez. And these are all a lot of business guys, guys that sit at the pub every weekend or every day, you know, have some bellies on them and they're like, we want to get fit. So they challenged themselves, like, it's 140k there. Um, so like, yeah, we've got to do it. So they did, like, this is awesome, let's do it every year. But then they want to make more of a reason behind it. So like, let's make something out of it. Let's get all, you know, obviously we're in a place in Monaco where there's a lot of wealth here, a lot of successful people, people that potentially want to do something good with their money as well. So they're like, okay, we'll support a local charity, the Princess Shelling Foundation, and ride from, they changed to go from saint Tropez to Monaco, uh, a few stops along the way and have a big party out of it in one day. So then year two, I think they did that and it was a little bit bigger. And then I think one year there was infamous year where I like just went a bit out of hand the night before and it's like, yeah, that was awesome. This sad. And then got huge interest. So I think the biggest we've had is around 100, 110, 120 people. Cause at the times as well, depending how it lines up, we've had, you know, some F1 ride drivers do it, some of the professional cyclists do it. And then, you know, so it's just a whole mix. And it's just a great day. It's just, it's about fun. It's about being together, teamwork. And then the Serena yeah. Minus, Prince Albert, he's joined, I think, one or two times he's done the entire ride. Or sometimes yeah. he'll just do from Nice or always come to the street party as well. So, you know, it's pretty cool if you think about it, to be able to be riding yeah. for a good cause with the Prince of Monaco. You know, it's just everything. And it's always a good laugh. Um, you can make some great connections as well there and... Also, that hasn't only been exclusively the guys. There's definitely been some women doing it as well. And, yeah, like, they're a group that over the years have definitely got to know a lot better. And I feel like they're another one of my communities here and have always been massive supporters of me. And, yeah, they're just a good group. And so then I got involved. And as part of that, I was also doing a bit of fashion design. I studied fashion design. And, like, yeah, if you want, I can do the kit for you, design it. And although it was quite a challenge because, you know, they have so many sponsors on there. So to try and make that look good is a challenge because yeah. you can't really do too much design aspect on that. 
we made it work and yeah it was obviously okay. quite fun to do that and you know get involved and I've only been able to do two or three of them because normally I'm away racing somewhere but yeah whenever I can I love to be able to support it because you know it's a great course and it's a great day out and yeah, yeah, I, and lay people like me get to meet you guys when you arrive in. Yeah, exactly. East, so we always have the amazing yeah. welcoming. You know, the partners come and the kids yeah. and both, as you say, in Nice and also at Stars and Bars. And there's always a big street party. Yeah. So it just brings the Monaco community together and a few people from abroad come. And yeah. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. The energy is so yeah. vibrant. Yeah. And Mark Thomas always makes a hilarious speech at exactly. the end of the night. So, like you said, it brings the community together. Yeah. And talking about the Princess Charlene Foundation, you've also um, done the water challenge. Yes, yeah, water bike challenge. What was that like compared <laughs> to road riding? It's actually quite different to what you think. From the first year to the second year, though, they improved the bikes. But the first year was actually really, really hard. You know, it definitely favoured the bigger, more powerful, like the rugby boys, like this, because, and the concept from the first year, I think that was, you know, it's a testing year, and they learn from the first yeah. year to the second year, okay, change of format, but yeah, first year, the best way to explain it, for people who know cycling, is it's like being on a ergo, so an indoor trainer, that's not yeah. quite smooth, you know, where you're just judding along, like, yeah, it's very hard resistance, and whereas the second year round is really fun, you know, and I think yeah. it worked a lot better for the community as well. Again, it was a fantastic community event. For me personally, it's been an amazing event because they get a lot of top athletes from around the world, and it was just, you know, for me to be around the likes of these incredible sports people and just connecting with them, you know, because we're all good in our own right or whatever, or have our yeah. place in our own spots, but, you know, to be able to overlap, like, I love that, to be able to meet other successful people, people with the same drive, the same goals, retired or still yeah. playing, is also amazing, because even with the retired ones, you can learn so much from them, because all of our sport will end eventually, you know, our careers will yes. end, we need to have those opportunities, and there's so many stories, people go through those loop periods, but, you know, to talk to them, to hear about their experiences, and how to best prepare yourself, even things like that, it's been amazing, and, and they're all really yeah. cool people as well, so that was another really, really fun to be a part of, and I know they've got to do another one next year, so this year they had a hiatus, but um, yeah, I always love to be a part of and support it, because you know, I know a lot of the guys and girls, the men and women who put it together, and yeah, like I said, again, it's this community, and whenever I can get back to you know, a place like Monaco, or anywhere where I'm living, it's, it's nice. And yeah. I enjoy doing different activities as well. It's wonderful to see you really throwing yourself in with the community and for the lay people to see so many incredible athletes, like you say, from different backgrounds, yeah. all mixing together. Yeah, definitely. It is. And for a good cause. Exactly, definitely, yeah. So when I get these different opportunities, yeah, I can just throw myself in. When I'm available within reason, obviously, because my schedule can be quite hectic sometimes. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for in likeness and sharing all your background with us. It's fantastic and good luck for 2020. Thanks so much and no worries. Thanks for the chat. Thank you.